My name is Molly Broadway. Uh, I am a training and technical support specialist for voting rights. Um, and then I have my partner in crime who I will allow to introduce himself. I'm Jeff Miller and I'm a senior policy specialist here at Disability Rights Texas and I focus on voting rights. Yes, and so we um, have created this training um, with the intent of it being geared towards uh, people who are working at polling sites, towards election workers. Um, we have uh, created this training to, um, well, we'll talk about that, kind of what our goals are for this experience. But in case some of you are not familiar with who disability rights is or what we are, um, basically, um, each state has what's called a protection and advocacy agency, um, and we are the one for Texas. So what that means is we exist to help protect and secure, um, well, secure and advance the rights of people with disabilities. Um, and that is a pretty broad description, um, but that's... I, I like to think of it this way, that when Congress um, was actually enacting rights for people with disabilities through things like the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or the Americans with Disabilities Act, or Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act, or whatever, Congress figured out pretty quick that just because you have a right, if you don't have any way to enforce that right, it doesn't work real well. And so the Protection and Advocacy uh, Network was created by Congress for that reason, to give individuals with disabilities a way to have their rights enforced and to learn about their rights. And as part of that process, when the Help America Vote Act was passed um, in the early 2000s, the Protection and Advocacy Network was specifically designated in that law to provide um, information training and help work on access rights of voters with disabilities. Yeah. You've all had your, your history lesson for today, so we can go home. You're always so much better at that part than I am. Thank you, Jeff. Um, why is the issue, you may be asking, why is the issue of knowing how to best serve voters with disabilities important? Um, and a simple answer uh, is that people with disabilities vote. And um, I know it's mind blowing, but it happens. Um, we it's we are in an underserved uh, community. Not everybody is is um, confident in how to best serve voters with disabilities or know all the rights of of what voters can ask for for accommodations. And so we're here to discuss that. The slide uh, that you see before you has all the um, fancy cocktail party statistics you can come up with. Um, basically, we are a large voting block within the state of Texas and the United States, um, and um, we have a large say when it comes to voting. I think we are a powerful force. Um, and so to just be aware of that. Today's goals from this training, um, you know, they're, they're few, but so important. Um, basically, we want to help ensure that e we want you to know that each voter, regardless of the type of support that they need, um, has the right to choose to exercise their right to vote um, and that it should be a positive thing. Um, and we want, from that experience, we want you to know how to respond appropriately um, and respectfully to people who are requesting accommodations um, and that you also know the voters' rights to accessibility and the kind of accommodations they can request. Um, Sounds good. Pretty simple. Uh, some six basic guidelines, we've broken it down for you. Um, Six easy things, so no worries. Um, yeah. It's basically, I think these guidelines exist to, I think the overarching air we want is just to create, everybody wants to be respected. Everybody wants to be treated with dignity and be able to exercise their civil rights. I, I think that sometimes when we think about working with people with disabilities, we put the, the air quotes up around it. Um, we overthink that whole process. We wonder, we, we wonder about you know, p voters with disabilities, what does that mean? And what am I supposed to do? And should I talk to them or not talk to them or whatever? And I think that um, these six basic guidelines are just 
a way for us to stop and think about the fact that voters with disabilities are voters first. They really just want to vote. And so if we just keep it simple and not try to overthink things about, should I use this word or that word, or should I call it? Just ask somebody what their name is, be real, be real to them, they'll be real to you. And if you have questions, I think that the number one biggest thing to learn about working with voters with disabilities is if you have a question, ask. If you're unsure about something, ask, because the voter is the best expert on their support needs. Um, just some, you know, we kind of touched a little bit on this. Sometimes this comes up in trainings that we've done previously, and it's about how to address an individual. And like Jeff said, you know, just, just talk to them, just address them by the name, by their name, I would say overall. But generally speaking, um, there is a practice if you ever have questions about people first language, and you don't really know what that is. This basically just refers to the individual first and puts the disability second. Um, so you know, it could be instead of a deaf person, it could be a person with a hearing impairment. Um, basically, it's putting emphasis on the individual and not the disability or the barrier that exists. Um, of course, that's to say, um, there are everybody has a different preference resource. on how to address that. And so, uh, you know, it, pe some people identify much differently than through person first language. Um, but basically it's that individual's right. Uh, they can use whatever they want. And you, it's basically up to you to follow their suit, I would say. We're not here to make political statements. We're just here to make everybody feel welcome and, and exactly. engage the vote. I think that's what everybody wants overall. Um, so we just try to extend that in our everyday practice. Language and invisible, excuse me, invisible disability. Um, this came up as a question, this comes up as a question sometimes um, on how to address this. And um, basically invisible disabilities are, when we say use this term, this means um, a, a disability or something that is not physically obvious to another person. So that can be an intellectual and developmental disability, uh, mental health challenge. A um, traumatic brain injury. Traumatic English. brain injury. Absolutely. Or, you know, um, non-advanced physical impairments, perhaps, or nerve issues. So, Molly, since some people have invisible disabilities, how do I know if someone has a disability and needs some help or support or something like that? How can I tell? You can't. Um, basically, I know. It's, it's not your job to figure that out, uh, Jeff, as, as an election worker. Uh, in that situation... I just always, you know, ask, I always ask individuals, no matter who they are, everybody, I would ask, do you need any help? Do you need any extra help with anything? Are you good to go? And that will prompt the individual to let me know if they do or do not need help. Um, and if I think that someone looks like they have a disability and I assume that they're going to need help, I don't want to go ahead and help them. I don't want to <laughs> offer assistance because that person may be really intent on casting their ballot independently which is and their right. I think that usually in life, we learn that making assumptions about other people isn't usually a good idea. So if you have a question, ask. Otherwise, just treat people like everybody else. Yes. And mostly, you know, and if you find that somebody's, you know, I think as an election worker, you're probably taught if someone's floundering around and they kind of are having trouble, just go ahead and ask them. There's no harm in that. Just make sure you're doing it for everyone and not just because someone looks like they have a disability and they need some extra help. Good point. Um, <laughs> this comes to a, 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 an important part of knowing that uh, if someone has an assistant with them or they have an aide with them, um, it's important to not speak to that assistant or aide. You must speak directly with the voter. Um, they are an individual. They are very capable of making their own decisions. It's respectful. Um, so just address the voter and not the assistant. Uh, um, go ahead. I have a, a friend who, um, uses a, a wheelchair and he always tells the story about not only does everybody, if there's somebody with him, want to speak to it, like if he goes somewhere, they speak to his wife instead of to him. But also when he's in line somewhere or whatever, people assume not only that, um, people in wheelchairs, 
um, can't make their own decisions or whatever, but they also assume that they're deaf because they're said yeah. people are always talking about him. He's sitting you know, there two feet away from him and they just act like he isn't there. So just be aware. Yeah. Well, that reminds me, I was helping a friend of mine at a job fair and uh, she is blind. And so I was guiding her from table to table, kind of explaining to her what job providers were where. And uh, so I was guiding her and telling her about an employer in front of us. And um, the guy started talking to me, asking about what she was interested in. I was like, I, I'm not the one looking for a job. You should probably ask her. Uh, she's way more qualified than I am for anything. So little things like that. Um, you know, everybody likes their autonomy and they want to make their own decisions. So there you go. Um, let's move on. I think we're good. Yeah. Um, do unto others the golden rules we've said before basically treat everybody with dignity and respect. Um, that goes a long way. And I think everybody has an experience in their life where, um, you know, just being treated fairly and, and with worth that means a lot more. Well, and it could really encourage a person to come back and vote again, you know. And I mean, we all need support in, of one kind or another. Some people just need a different kind of support. And so if we just treat everybody with, like you said, with dignity and respect, I think we're all going to be better off for it. Good experiences lead to, you know, you could come in with good a voters. statistic saying if someone has a good experience voting in person, they're going to want to come back and do it again. So I think there's a lot to be said for that. Or polling, we, Disability Rights Texas is a polling site in Travis County. Um, and so we are generally speaking in an accessible building. Um, and so we're very aware of, of how to best interact with individuals. We always get, and I think that rubs off on the election workers who work the polling site. And, and from that, we always get a lot of feedback stating um, voters have a really good experience. They want to come back to that particular site and vote because of the positive experience and the respect that they were treated with. So just something to think about. Um, assistive devices. This is, is important stuff. Um, Generally speaking, uh, an assistive device, when we say this, we mean um, items like wheelchairs or walkers or canes or um, what anything that to help somebody in their day-to-day -day right. life. Um, generally speaking, this is an extension of the individual's body. So don't try to like grab the cane or the chair or whatever. Um, ask you know, permission to provide assistance, um, even if you mean well. Um, it could be seen as you grabbing on somebody that didn't want to be grabbed on. Um, so, you know, just that, yeah. ask if you can help. Um, yeah, I have one time worked with somebody who used a scooter to get around and she didn't always use it, but sometimes she did. And um, we were at uh, like an after hours meeting at work and um, somebody jumped onto her scooter and started riding it around and I was flabbergasted and I thought oh my god he's, he's gonna he's gonna like just spontaneously combust I don't know what's gonna happen and I was like and I couldn't believe he was doing that and so finally somebody came in and and um basically reamed him out um good yeah so um you know that's somebody's tool don't you know when I was growing up my dad did sheet metal um, and I was always taught you don't mess with somebody's tools. And that's the same thing. You don't mess with somebody's tools. Um, so just let them do what they need to do and don't take control of it for them. Um, service animals, always a big issue or always not a big issue, but a big topic of conversation, generally speaking. Um, just like any kind of like human assistant or assistive tool that someone uses, uh, this is not... Uh, something to be paid attention to. It's essentially a tool for someone to use to function their day-to-day -day life. Don't be distracted by the animal. Please refrain from petting it um, or even talking to it. Um, it's not a pet. It's not something to feed. Um, that animal is working. It's doing a task. So, you know. No selfies with the service. No selfies with the service animal. Um, let the voter do what they need to do with the animal. Um, if the animal is under control and not a threat to anybody, then they are allowed into the polling site. Um, so generally speaking, 
Um, that's the rule. If the animal's not out of control, then what, what, but, okay. But you mentioned that, Molly. So what happens if a service animal does start jumping on things or barking or acting antisocial? Well, I would uh, ask the voter um, if everything's okay, because uh, sometimes animals uh, are trying to alert their their owner of something. Um, that something's about to happen sometimes. Um, but I would ask the voter if everything's okay, um, if they needed assistance, and if not, if they could please get their service animal under control. And if they were not able to, and it was disrupting other voters' experiences, I would ask them to maybe leave, um, or if they could yeah. put the animal outside and continue to vote if possible, that would be great. But that would be the way I would handle it personally. Um, as an election worker, do I need to ask um, the voter for the license or whatever of the service animal to prove that the service animal is a service animal? No, you don't. Um, no. Just as it is not as an election worker, it is not your role or our role to prove one's disability status. It's not your role to verify the validity um, of a service animal. Um, you know, your job is to help someone vote. And uh, as long as that gets done, you've done your job. So there you go. Providing assistance without judgment. Nobody likes to be judged. Um, so basically, um, like we said before, voters with disabilities may not necessarily need help. Uh, they want to do it on their own. Um, so just let the voter do what they need to do. If they need help, they will ask. Um, and if they are, if they seem a little shy, um, just as a standard rule, I would say, ask everybody, do you need any assistance when you go vote? Um, or if you have any questions while voting, please feel free to check in. Um, so there's that. And don't make a big deal about it. If somebody needs assistance, um, don't get nervous about it. Um, it is what it is. Just offer your assistance. Um, um, go ahead. I was just going to say, it, the other part of that is if someone requests an, using the accessible machine or assistance of some sort, it really isn't the poll workers or the election workers' role to challenge that or make an assumption that they don't, quote unquote, look disabled. Um, like Molly said earlier, if someone has a disability and asks for an accommodation or assistance, we just assume that they're telling us what they need and help them vote. Um, so just some pinpoints. Um, remember, person with a disability is the best judge of their own capabilities. So um, it's up to them whether or not they need help or not. Um, it may be awkward or disrespectful um, or even dangerous to ask to try to help someone who doesn't <laughs> need the help. Um, make you your assistance. You that if you What's that? You, said you might get a backhand if you're not <laughs> careful because they don't know what's going on. You can speak. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, make your assistance available to everyone. And then, you know, always say, you know, be thankful for, you know, show happiness that the person came out to vote. That's a big deal. Um, you know, so why not celebrate it? Kind of like when you see, I'm sure a lot of polling sites do this, when a new voter comes to cast their ballot, some I've seen places like make a big deal when they come get their ballot and they, they applaud or make some noise or cheer. You know, why not do that for everybody? It's the same for kind everyone. of deal. Yeah. I would personally love an audience of, applause, you know, just applause every time I try to do something. So um, before we move on, we have one question in the Q&A. Yes, um, it is. If someone comes in with a dog not wearing a sign, is to ask if it's a service dog? It is. Um, and actually, um, there is no requirement that a, a service animal actually wear a harness or a badge or a vest or whatever. Um, so if someone comes in with a, an animal like that or a dog, um, it is appropriate to ask, is that a service animal? And if they say yes, that's really should be the end of it. Um, technically, in a public accommodation, you can ask if it's a service animal and what the animal's trained to do. Usually, I don't think there's any reason 
to do that if, in a polling location. If someone comes in with an animal and represents that it's a service animal, I think we can just take their word for it. And as long as, like Molly said earlier, as long as the, the dog is under control, there shouldn't be a problem. Good question. Thank you. We're, and I think we said we were going to stop at certain points. Does anybody have a question over any of the stuff we just talked about that would like to ask it? We have a, another question in the Q&A, but I think you're going to cover it later on. So, so I to do that one. But okay. if there's anybody that wants to ask a question with their raised hand on what we just covered. I'm not seeing anything, so let's go ahead and move on to the move next on, one. All right, preparing the polling place, uh, you know, the actual act of accommodating voters with disabilities. And th th these next few slides about preparing the polling place, none of this is rocket science. The whole point of these slides is just, again, to remind us that when we're thinking about accommodating people with disabilities, it's just accommodating voters in general. And the more that we think through things in advance, the easier it goes for everybody, people with support needs and without. Sometimes um, this first slide talks about posting signs. And so sometimes at a polling site, I mean, a lot of polling sites, you need to post signs in general, um, but there may be more specific signs that need to be posted that mark an accessible pathway, or accessible parking or curbside voting. Um, and if that should exist, um, or if that is, if that does come up, keep in mind that the signs themselves um, should be visually simple and clear, uh, legible, um, and in and around the polling place. So, you know, if you're trying to mark an accessible pathway into the building, it's probably good to put it close to the pathway um, or to the main pathway of the building and not yeah. In the back. Um, the language on these signs should be easily understood um, and direct voters to their proper locations, instruct the voters on how to accomplish the task. The fewer words, the better. That's right. Um, yeah. And it just, I'll just put in one plug about um, curbside voting. It's a question that we hear a lot. Um, during every voting season, we get calls from people that go to vote someplace and either there's no sign for curbside voting, the sign doesn't tell the voter how to notify someone inside um, that they're there to curbside vote, meaning that there's not a phone number or a buzzer or anything. So your signs for curbside voting, please have them. Uh, identify uh, where someone's supposed to park the curbside vote and give the um, the voter a way to let you know that they're there to vote. The other thing that I think is important just to think about, sometimes we put signs up outside like for curbside voting and it's just like a sheet of paper on, on something and after about 10 minutes, it starts to curl and you can no longer read the sign. So think about things like that, about where the sign is going to be located and what kind of material it's made of and that sort of stuff. More than anybody ever wanted to know about signs, but there you go. Welcome to our world. Um, also, clear paths. Obviously, um, clear pathways um, to your voting machine, to the building entrance from the parking lot are very important and part of um, the compliance of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Generally speaking, um, if clear the pathways, make sure they are removed, any barriers um, or other kind of obstacles are removed from the pathway. Um, kind of put in, to figure that out, whether or not something should be removed, I always encourage people to kind of put yourself, walk the pathway that you're gonna walk. Um, a trick that somebody one time told me, um, because I'm pretty seemingly able body. So when I inspect polling sites, my challenge was, how am I going to, am I going to be able to notice everything that maybe I would be able to notice that I was in a mobility assistance device in a wheelchair or something. And um, my predecessor told me something that she would encourage people to do because she was in a wheelchair. She told me to um, kind of scoot my feet around. So I don't really have them leave the surface. That way I could tell where any bumps, large bumps or wires were, and that would impede one's path of travel. Um, so 
maybe do that when you're going along a path that way you'll see like if there's any wires or any potential tripping hazards that there, that are there or any bumps in the concrete or sidewalk you'll know it's there and maybe you can you know put a cone over a you know a rise in the sidewalk that way someone knows to avoid it um, or put something there that would impede them from go you know hitting the bump um, so there's that um, check for adequate clearance. This kind of goes with that, um, making sure there's enough space to move around. Uh, the general um, measurement um, for walkways is 36 inches wide. Doorways need to be 32 inches wide, I believe. Um, so, you know, just heads up about that. Um, if um, I was just gonna say, when you're thinking about adequate clearance, one of the things to consider is, when someone is coming into the registration table, um, whether or not, and they're using a wheelchair or a scooter, can they access the pull book? Um, is it close enough to the edge? And is there enough clearance to get the chair underneath the table or whatever? And be um, mindful of the fact if there's a table skirt or a covering on the table, that tablecloth can be a, an added barrier. So make sure that even with that tablecloth there or the table skirt around this, this table, that someone that's using a mobility device can still access the pull book. Good point. Uh, set up and be familiar with accessible voting equipment. Um, a lot of phone calls since, because at Disability Rights Texas, we have a statewide voter hotline. And so we get a lot of calls from individuals um, with questions about voting and if they are experiencing hard times while at the polling site. Um, we get a lot of phone calls about uh, the accessible voting machine not being turned on. Uh, of course, this is not the case for anybody who's who's watching this right now, who's a, who works, who serves as an election worker, um, but from time to time, there has been occasion that the accessible voting machines are not turned on um, during open polling times, um, and they're not turned on, and election workers don't know how to use the accessible voting machines. And so uh, if you leave today with nothing, I hope you at least know to become familiar with your accessible voting machine. Uh, your, the county elections staff should know how to use it. They are trained by the voting machine um, vendors. And so um, these, tool, these tools should be available to every voter who requests it. Um, the machine should be turned on when all the other machines are turned on. Um, and if you don't know, this is a great opportunity to ask. Um, it's better to know how to maneuver with, maneuver uh, an accessible voting machine, how to use all the accessories to it beforehand than to try to figure it out with around in front of the voter. Yeah. Um, and sometimes there are election workers who ask voters if they know um, how to use this stuff. And that is not the most professional approach. Um, it's honest, which I applaud, but not the most appropriate. Uh, professional. And with so many counties purchasing new voting machines, a lot of voters don't know the ins and outs of these new voting machines. And so it's it's up to us as, as professionals to provide that knowledge to the voters. Um, and so that's about it. If you don't know um, and you ask your county staff for more information and they don't have it, please feel free to contact us. Uh, contact Disability Rights Texas, contact the league, and, and we can hook you up with that information. Uh, accessible supplies, this kind of goes in hand just, with what we discussed. You just know. be prepared. Be prepared, you know. Just like your Anything mom used you to tell you, wear clean underwear, be prepared, you know, have a pen and paper if needed, some extra chairs. Um, anything you can do to best serve the voters who need it. Uh, any, let's see, what's this one? And that, that's basically what we talked about okay, perfect. before, so. We're at a stopping point. And so if anybody has any questions, we're happy to oblige. At this so point. there are questions in the Q&A. Um, how do we notify people with blindness about safe paths 
curbside, curbside voting, etc. Okay, so um, generally speaking, every polling site should be physically accessible. Um, and so it, um, a person who is blind or visually impaired, the route they take should be safe. Um, if they are trying, if they are inside the building and they're trying to maneuver from like the check-in table to the voting machine, uh, you are totally able to give them directions or help ask if you would like them to guide, at, excuse me, I'm getting everything mixed up. Ask if you would like, if they would like you to guide them to the voting machine. There it is, I got it. There you it. go, you got it. Coffee kicked in. Um, you can ask um, if they would like assistance with that. Um, otherwise, um, for accessible voting um, or for curbside voting, um, I mean, they can always if they, we they encourage ask if, I mean, if curbside voting. I think they would ask. Um, in terms of accessible pathways, if someone's using a white cane, um, it's always a good idea. If there is something on a wall that someone that is blind wouldn't necessarily know is there, to put a trash can or put a cone on the, the floor underneath that. Right. So let's say like I've so seen a lot of sometimes, I've seen like uh, fire extinguishers on the wall or like TVs that are on walls and maybe they're hanging a little lower than what sconces is allowed. Lights. Yeah, yeah, sconces, lights, all sorts of options. What I suggest individuals do is like put like what Jeff said, some sort of um, object underneath there. That way, if they're using a white cane, they know that they can't walk in, in that direction. Okay. So the next question is, if a building is ADA compliant, does that mean that the doors are compliant? It should. Generally speaking, yes. Okay. What was the adequate clearance again for wheelchairs? 36 inches wide for and 32 inches wide for doorways? Yes, 36 inches for sidewalks um, and 32 inches for doorways. Okay. And then um, at polling or centers- Or if you're like me, with... the amount of space it takes for a double wide stroller to get through a door. So. <laughs> so, um, at a polling center, can a person with disabilities be moved to the front of the line to cast their ballot? Good question. Would you like to take this one, Jeff? Um, sure. There's actually a provision in the election code that says that if someone has a mobility impairment um, and can't wait in line, that they have the right to request from the polling judge um, to be moved to the front of the line to vote. Uh, along with the state law, there's also just the idea under the Americans with Disabilities Act, if because of someone's support needs, they can't stand in line, they can request an accommodation. Now, it's totally up to the judge to determine whether or not someone gets to go to the front of the line. But one of the things that even if a judge deems that it's not appropriate to have them cut in, in line, they should at least be able to have a chair, have a seat, and hold their place in line until it's their turn. So just do that would be a reasonable accommodation is to give someone a chance to sit down, even if they don't go to the front of the line. And then I see the question, I think it came from the last section, I yeah, I think, think you're going to cover it some in the third section. Yeah. It's a nice segue. Yeah, um, so let's go ahead and talk about rights of voters with disabilities to accommodations and accessibility, Molly. Yay, I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> um, so when we talk about rights to accessibility, generally we are referring to um, various laws and policies that have been um, defined through the um, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, also, there's the Voting Rights Act also gives us some. Yeah. Some stuff. Yes. Um, accessibility, generally, um, when we speak of it, we're talking about um, 
the definition of a, an approach or admission. Um, you know, it's the, basically the opposite of segregation is what I like to tell people. Um, churches come up a lot for accessibility questions. Um, generally speaking, I'll tell you that if a church is serving as a polling site, um, it has agreed. Churches generally don't have, if a church is a church, it doesn't have to meet accessibility guidelines. If a church is serving as a polling site, it does need to meet accessibility guidelines because it is participating in a federal or state or local election, which has to adhere to ADA laws. The election has to be accessible, but the church doesn't. So there you, go. you got to make the program accessible. So anyway. Yes. And basically accessibility in general um, just makes, just ensures that we all have accessibility and opportunity to, you know, exercise our tasks of daily living and our civil rights. So, yeah. so, so broad and complex yet so simple. Um, so when we talk about voter rights and accommodations, there are a couple different things we are referencing, uh, generally speaking. Overall, the right, every voter has the right to cast their ballot privately and independently. Uh, they also, voters have the right to a physically accessible polling site. Uh, they have the right to use an accessible voting machine. They have the right to assistance, meaning um, they can bring an assistant with them of their choosing, as long as it's not their employer or um, union representative. Um, the right to a reasonable request, a reasonable accommodation or modification. If you are a voter with a disability, you have the right to request these um, and also access to curbside voting. And can I just say what I always say when we talk about curbside voting? Um, every polling location should offer curbside voting, but curbside voting is not an excuse for a polling location not to be physically accessible. Yeah. So... so a polling site must be physically accessible and offer curbside voting. It, it's not an either or sort of thing. It's a both. It's a both. Um, so providing assistance or the right to assistance, um, providing support to voters can include many things. Um, with, I mean, when, yeah. when we think of someone assisting somebody, typically we think of things like someone that reads the ballot to someone or marks the ballot for them. Um, I mean, that's classic assistance. But under the Americans with Disabilities Act, in order to cast a ballot independently and privately, if because of my um, if I have a support need that requires some, some kind of a, either assistance in order to do that or a modification of the, the policy or program, the way things are being done, I have a right to ask for that. And it can be whatever is necessary based on my needs, me meeting the voter with a disability. So while lots of people classically need help either reading the ballot or marking the ballot, I may need someone to remind me of what I'm doing and how to do things by cueing me, by giving me cues, or um, I may answer questions for someone as an accommodation to support them. It's whatever the voter with a disability needs in order to participate in the election process. Yep. Um, as long as I'd say, as long as you are um, not providing assistance to someone who is not eligible for assistance, um, that you know, I mean, that, that you the, know of, it, it, it's a knowing thing. The anyway, other big no-no yeah. is just um, preparing the ballot in any other way than what the voter wants it done. So you cannot put your opinion on the ballot or what you think is the right decision. You so have to reflect what the voter wants. If I'm assisting someone, I need to assist someone and not... Um, that's the idea. Yeah. It's a crazy concept, but that's what we like to go with. Um, would you like to take this one? Well, I was going to say, okay. and I think you mentioned this before, but um, under the Voting Rights Act, if someone... Um, cannot cast their ballot independently because of their support needs. They have a right to assistance, and that ass assistance can be in the form of a person that of their choice, and that's what the, the term that the law uses, a assistance, a sister of their choice, as long as it's not, as Molly stated earlier, their employer or an agent of their union. So 
they anybody else is fair game and they can bring them with them and that person can assist them um, in voting in person or filling out their mail-in ballot. The person assisting must take an oath though. They must sign an oath that basically says that they promise not to do anything that the voter hasn't asked them to do. So that you have to promise that you're not gonna vote your opinion, you're gonna follow the lead of the voter you are assisting. So like Jeff and I work together and let's say there's a union at where we work and I'm an officer of the union, but Jeff needs assistance. He couldn't use me as his assistant because I'm an officer in the union. So sorry, Jeff, can't help you out again. I'm so sorry. Um, So there you go. The the, the other thing to know, um, I guess we should just mention there um, is that if a person needs someone to physically assist them in voting, but they don't have anybody that they brought with them, then two poll workers or two election workers should assist them to vote. So if they if they don't bring someone, then so, it, that assistance should be provided. But it's like two voters, it's two election workers during early voting, right? Yes. And then one on election day. That's my, yes. Yeah. It's the impression we're under. So types of assistance, um, more information on types of assistance that can be offered. Um, having an interpreter. So um, as our lovely We have a lovely window here with Ms. Lauren. Um, If someone has an ASL interpreter, um, they can utilize that individual or they can also request an interpreter from the county. Um, Basically, if it is a language that the individual cannot read, um, then they can request assistance for an interpreter. There is the accessible voting machine. Um, It is a lot of times referred to as the DRE. Um, And so they're different portions of this machine that make it accessible to voters. Uh, It's, there's an audio portion of the ballot, which, so the the ballot's gonna be read to you. So there's gonna be earphones that are included with the machine um, and the person can have the ballot read to them. Um, An increased font size uh, on the screen, which uh, can be adjustable um, per the voter. Uh, There's a high contrast to help with visible or with visual uh, difficulties. There's an audio or or I'm sorry, like just a tactile keypad, what I would call like uh, like a video game remote almost that can extend from the voting machine. Um, and it should have buttons. So if someone cannot mark the machine on the screen, this will extend so that the ballot can be marked. There's buttons, there should be braille on that little extension. Um, so it's more accessible for voters. Um, there should be an outlet for a sip and puff device. Usually people who utilize this tool will use their own and have one to use or they'll bring it with them um, and they can plug it into the voting machine. Um, So there is that. Um, The accessible voting machine is also portable. So if someone needs to access or vote via curbside, that machine will be brought out to the voter and they can cast their ballot that way. Um, Another type of assistance when voting in person is, um, which was spoken about earlier, is the spot in line, um, the voting order priority. So if someone cannot stand for long periods of time, they can ask the precinct judge if they can be moved to the front of the line. Um, And the precinct judge then has the right to say yes or no. And if they say no, the voter can also request to have their spot saved while they sit down. And then when your spot comes up in line, you can go check in with you know, check all the boxes and sign all the things and then go vote. Also to note, I think curbside voting, people think maybe that you just get served right away with your ballot and that's not the case. You have a spot in line. Um, So when that spot in line comes up, then the ballot will be brought out to you and you can cast your ballot. Okay, Um, new in-person voting laws. think this is all up to date. So um, in-person voting, voters who um, obviously we've kind of discussed a lot of this already. Exactly. Um, when signing the oath, assistants must provide their relationship to the voter, your address, and mark that you didn't receive any kind of compensation for your service. Um, also important to note that if someone is a personal assistant or aide to a voter, and they are conflicted about this because they're getting paid to do their job. And so they're not sure if they can sign the oath because of the compensation. 
um, clause, you actually can because in the Texas election. You're exempted. Code, yes, you are exempt. Um, curbside voting. So, so a person who transports, so let's say you work at like a nursing home and you're going to transport a bunch, you know, like a small van worth of people to go vote. Um, if they're all going to vote curbside, you, if you transport seven or more people at the same time. That are not related to you. Yes. Then you must complete and sign a form that says that provides your name and address and whether you're providing assistance properly and without compensation. So if you're just doing your job and you're working at like a residential facility and you're just trying to drive people to go vote and they all want to do curbside, if it's seven or more and you're not related, you got to sign some paperwork. Um, but let's say you have, you know, seven or more cousins that you're taking to go vote. Um, <laughs> you don't have to sign an oath. So um, that all want to vote curbside. So there's that. Poll watchers. Poll so watchers. One of the um, lots of discussion during the last legislative sessions about poll watchers and new authority that poll watchers have. And basically, poll watchers now have the right to observe everything. Um, it, but there's an except to that. Poll watchers have the right to observe someone being assisted while they're in the polls, but a poll watcher does not have the right to actually watch you vote. So when you are actually casting your ballot, even if you have assistance, the poll watcher does not have the right to be in the area so that they can see you're actually casting up the ballot. Yeah, easy peasy. I'm sure we're not gonna get any questions about that at all. No. And before we, we run out of time, let's talk about this real quick. Um, yeah. So one of the other major things that happened um, in the revision of the voting laws that was passed by the legislature last year was um, a provision that limited or purported to limit the type of assistance that an individual with a disability who is voting can receive. And the new law said that the assister had to limit their assistance to reading the ballot, marking the ballot, or instructing the voter to read the ballot or mark the ballot. The new law also said that the, um, the assister had to sign an oath under penalty of perjury where they promised only to, to limit their assistance to those four things. So at the end of June and became uh, public last month, a court, a federal court has ruled that that provision um, in the new law or those two provisions are unenforceable because they violate an earlier court ruling in another case around assistance uh, being provided to voters. And all you really need to know is that now a, a voter that needs assistance has the right to any kind of reasonable assistance that they need based on their disability or support needs. We have a lot of information probably to share, but I know there's also a lot of questions. Yeah, um, so let's just go on to the last, to the um, the reasonable accommodation slide real quick. Oh my, oh my, okay, there we go. So another part of SB1 or the voting law that was passed um, last year is this reminder that uh, the legislature made it explicitly clear now that um, nothing in the Texas Elections Code limits the ability of a qualified voter with a disability from re requesting a reasonable accommodation under state and federal law. So if someone needs an a certain kind of accommodation or modification like we talked about before in order to vote, they have a right to request that. So your, um, the way that that works in your particular polling location, there should be a policy or a practice in, in place where if someone needs a, an additional accommodation of some kind that they have a way to request that. And let's answer questions. Yeah. Can, let's skip okay. your pop quiz and just go to questions. Yeah, we have a lot of questions, especially, you know, especially around, you know, the poll watchers and stuff. And so there is um, some questions about, um, you know, we, we expect that there will be lots of challenges by poll watchers 
Um, is it correct that a poll worker can't summarize or provide in lay language about a ballot measure to a voter who said who stated they could not understand the ballot wording? Um, a poll worker can read the ballot or read the, the, the language. A poll worker actually should not be, um, if you're talking about an actual ballot measure, the poll worker should not be um, summarizing that. That is correct. Okay. They, they can, a, a, you can tell someone all about the procedure and how to vote and what it, what's on the ballot and how to use the ballot. But um, when you get into actually summarizing a ballot measure, then opinions get involved and it gets sticky. So, um, but if it's there is. If it's now, if it's their them, assistant, can the assistant? their assistant can can help them, and they can they are allowed to bring in a sample ballot or a cheat sheet with those things already um, determined, and the the assister can remind somebody of what's on their sample ballot. Okay, but a poll worker unsolicited should or a poll worker that should not of themselves be summarizing the ballot. Okay, so we had a couple of questions about um, Braille. Um, are Braille machines available at polling locations or are the ballots available in Braille? A voter, if a voter would like a Braille ballot, they need to request it from the county. They need in to request advance. it ahead of time. Um, on the machines, there should be Braille, if I'm I'm trying to think of all the voting machines yes. that are available. There should be Braille on the voting machines where the buttons are. Um, and if not, um, the, the voter's assistant can help them or as an election worker, you can tell them what buttons do what. Hopefully that helps answer your question. Um, and in terms of signage and curbside voting, there is no specific law that requires there to be a certain kind of sign. Um, although I would argue that in order for the process to actually be workable, you have to have a sign so people know about it. But um, we have been working with counties to try to ensure that everybody has good signage in place. Um, are we supposed to ask about a relationship between the person and their assistant? The form that the assister fills out will ask that the poll worker doesn't have to um, ask that question. Now they can make, they need, they if it's not filled out on the form, then they can ask and, and ask that the assister fill it out, but the form should take care of that. Um. This was somebody just sharing that yes, two worker election workers on election day are oh, okay, so it's wait, reversed. Two election workers on election day and one election worker during oh, early voting. Okay. So just the opposite of now. Um, unfortunately, the new state law, if a person requests assistance from the poll worker, a poll watcher can watch the whole voting process up close. What can be done if the voter objects? Mm -hmm. Like I said, but the law, the law does make it clear that the poll watcher cannot be in the voting booth when the vote is being cast. They can watch all the rest of the process, but when the assister is assisting someone to actually cast their ballot, the poll watcher doesn't have the right to be in the so they could, booth when they're voting. You could almost say they could watch from afar, but they can't yeah. like be right up in there with the assistant and the elect the voter even when it's a poll worker and not their own assistant by, of choice, correct? Well, if it's a poll worker, there should be two people for that reason. Okay. If a poll worker is assisting okay. someone when you're... Um, well, somebody wanted to know... Uh, yeah, we got one minute. So um, I will try and print these questions and we will try and answer them and send them out to an email um, with everybody, uh, to everybody in attendance. Real quick, and I know one of the questions is what is a sip and puff device? Yeah. Basically, um, if you remember, um, what's his name? The guy who played Superman, the actor. 
Reeves, George Christopher Reeves, Reeves. Christopher Reeves. After his accident, um, he was in a wheelchair and he had a sip and puff device. He blew into it and it would help move him. It's around. a switch. It's a kind of switch yeah. that you can operate using your head as opposed to your other extremities. Okay, it is one o'clock, and so we we do need to wrap up. On the screen is um, the contact information for Molly and Jeff. If you have further questions, um, we will try and get the questions um, answered that we did not get to, um, and uh, mail those out to everybody. This uh, will be this has been recorded, and um, give us a week or two <laughs> um, to get it. Um, and up on our website, well, the league will have it on theirs, and I'm sure uh, DRT um, can also put it on their website, and um, we can uh, also plan to send it to the various election offices um, for them to have. So thank you again very much for attending, and um, uh, hope, hope this was uh, informative. I know it was for me, so <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.